when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we are all glad that you are here to worship with us today. For those of you who are worshiping with us at home, you may have some communion elements ready when we get to that and have your Bible ready if you'd like. You may even light a candle. So please join us now as we prepare to worship through music. Let us pray. God of deliverance, you work in this world to free us from what enslaves us. You heard the cries of your people in Egypt and came down to deliver them from slavery. You heard the cries of your people in Israel and beyond and came down to deliver us through Jesus. He took the form of a slave and became obedient unto death on a cross. He came to free us from bondage to sin and death. Hear the cries of your people wherever they are found, O God. Work in their lives and our lives that we might all be freed from fear and liberated by love to live as citizens of Christ's reign, in whose name we pray. Amen. Each month we're learning new ways of greeting one another. This month we have a special guest instructor and member of our church, Jessica. 
You may have seen her on TV providing interpretation for legislators in Salem communicating with the deaf and hard of hearing. This morning, she's going to teach us with hand and words how to exchange peace using American Sign Language. Jessica, the floor is yours. Yeah, why don't you step up right there? All right, um, who's right-handed? Okay, and then who's left-handed? Okay, left-handed people, you're gonna use your left hand. Right-handed people, you're gonna use your right. With your right hand or your dominant hand, have a C, like this. Start at your left or opposite shoulder and go down to your opposite hip, keeping like this. Yeah, that's Christ. Peace. Two hands, they start together, and they merge, and they go down. Peace. With. Just this, with. <laughs> and you. All right? So, Christ, peace, with. You. And how do you respond? <laughs> Make sure if it's me and if the person's here, you do it to that person. If they're over here, you do it to that person. If they're over here, you do it to this person. Uh, it's directional. <laughs> All right? They'll play the video so you can watch it again. So go greet each other. Christ, peace be with you. <laughs> It is a joyful thing to be exchanging peace with one another, whether by words or by hands. Uh, as we continue with our worship service, I would invite you to remain standing for our opening song, There's Within My Heart, a melody, which I think should have a barbershop quartet singing it. Just. as you are, and we will be presently singing our song, Welcoming Our Children Forward for Our Children's Moment. 
It is, you've heard it before, Lord, listen to my children playing. Good to see you, whether you are here or at home. Have you ever not shared a toy when you were supposed to? (laughs) Have you ever um, said something that you later wished you hadn't? (sighs) Have you ever not listened when a teacher or parent asked you to do something? We all have. Our Bible story is about how difficult and how hard it is sometimes when we know what's right to do, but we don't do that. And so sometimes it is hard to share. Sometimes it's hard to be kind with our words. Sometimes it's hard to listen well. The good news is we have a friend, Jesus, who helps us share better, speak more kindly, and listen more closely. Jesus loves us and helps us to share, to speak, and to listen in loving ways. And that is very good news because we all need help doing this, don't we? Remember, Jesus helps us be our very best selves. Let's have a prayer. Gracious God, we ask you to give these children and us all minds to know you, hearts to love you, and hands to serve you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. This moment of our worship where we get to share our um, celebrations, our joys, and also we lift up the prayers and concerns that are in our hearts or in our lives. As you know, some um, we're going to have a moment where our elder Judy is going to pass the microphone. Um, we are bro- bro- broadcasting this, so just use your first name and we will know who it is the prayer for. And I'm I'm gonna read the ones that we have here and then we'll have that opportunity for you to share yours. A prayer for Susan W, neighbors, young granddaughters that is hospitalized with a severe infection, prayers for her healing and support for her family. Prayers for Gary A, mother, who has uh, COVID and is at risk, but is doing well and improving with medicine. Prayers for Gary A, who is preparing for a serious eye surgery. 
and it also was exposed to COVID and it is at high risk. Prayers for vulnerable communities that have been affected by climate change. A few celebrations. We celebrate the birthday of Jim, Gary, Carol, John, and I know it's not here on the list, but I heard a birdie said that Wayne had a 92-year-old birthday. Wow. Happy birthday. <laughs> and prayers uh, for Sharon J., her family, for um, healing and wisdom. And a prayer of gratitude. Uh, gratitude for the ministry that Doug and Kathy had done uh, for the regional ministry that is about to, uh, they're about to retire, so it's about to close that chapter of their uh, ministry and find new ways of doing ministry, shared ministry with us. Any other joys and concerns? Allison received a letter the other day from the Library of Poetry, and her teachers entered her um, one of her poems into the National Student Poetry Contest, and she's one of the finalists. So we'll figure out, we'll find out in the end of September what she's won, if she's won. My company uh, had layoffs uh, Friday, and I lost uh, my supervisor. So I would just like prayers for our company uh, with wisdom to choose the right direction of their financials and uh, who my supervisor is going to be, and hopefully we have a good relationship. I wanted to um, introduce my sister uh, Sharon and brother-in-law David, who are visiting because this next week is the American Guild of Organists convention. And uh, it's happening in Portland, so we are grateful that they are here. I would just like to uh, share a joy that we all should have, that we have initiated this, t this time of prayers in our service. And I really am happy that it has been successful and good for all of us, and it keeps uh, us notified of people that need our prayers within our congregation and throughout the world. So thank you to everyone that was involved and continues to be involved. Thank you. Anyone else that has joys and concerns? Yes, uh, prayers for Brenda and I. <clears throat> we leave Thursday for Vietnam to visit our granddaughter. My son, his wife, and her parents are going to go on an Alaska cruise. They're in Seattle right now waiting to fly or get on the ship or whatever, but prayers that they have a good and safe trip. They're all pretty nervous. <laughs> Joy is that there's families that just came back from their travels safely, so welcome back as well. Um, I'd like to introduce Barbara. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> She's a newbie, and she joined the food pantry right away, and we had a wonderful time yesterday. I showed her how to do the front desk, which is the hardest part. Anyway, I'm so glad to see you here today. Welcome. Just one more, one person on there. Um, this is probably not on par with everybody else, but our yard seems to be bird central. We had a nest that we watched the mama bird raise her babies and they flew away. Now we have another one. I guess the neighborhood is good for birds. Our yard is anyway. Congratulations.
welcome to the folks that are even out on the crying room. Thank you. We're glad that you're here as well. It's a joy to have you here. One addition for health. Uh, my mom fell in the, her home last night, injured her knee, elbow, and head. Um, everything checked out okay at the ER, but um, as you know, we are, my brother and I are traveling uh, end of, well, it's going to be early Sunday morning, early, early, and um, next, this coming. So uh, it seems like it's a good time to be there. So I appreciate your continued prayers for her and my dad. Thank you. So what, let's take a moment of silence so we can have our own personal time of prayer, and then I'll close us in a communal prayer. Let us pray. God of healing and mercy, your presence sustains us when health is failing us. We pray for those with serious infections, whether they are at home or at hospitals. We pray for those with eye problems, for those that are pain, that suffer failed, for those with broken hearts, for those that feel unworthy, for those that have lost their jobs. May they feel your care through the hands of the caregivers, through the hands of their community. May they feel your peace while they await for answers in their uncertainty. May they feel reassurance knowing that they have many people praying for them. May they know that they are loved. We are grateful, Lord, for all the advances in medicine that allow us to be better and for all the ways that we can heal. We are grateful to celebrate birthdays. We are grateful for sharing in this your work. Please be with our regional ministers, Kathy and Doug, as they transition to new ways of ministry. May they know that they have done and made a difference in many people, people's life. Glory be your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans. Listen for God's word. It was sin, working death in me through what is good. In order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. Here ends our reading. May God bless our hearing, understanding, and living of these words. Good morning. It was a small town in upstate New York, an all-American suburb with neatly trimmed lawns. But something was wrong. Despite its normal appearance, something sinister was working its way through town. Lois Gibbs, a resident whose husband and children suffered from this mysterious malady, decided to do some research. She asked neighbors about their health issues and made a map of the whole city. She put a yellow dot for each stillborn child, birth defect, or cancer. Shockingly, The map was mostly yellow dots. She heard rumors a chemical company once owned her community's land. She wrote the company, asking if they knew anything. After a lengthy delay, they replied, Your findings are a statistical aberration. The land you live on is completely safe and we know nothing about this. Her findings were dismissed by the state health department because she was just a housewife with a high school education. She went to the local paper, prompting an EPA team to do a soil and water analysis. They found the entire town was being poisoned by dioxin one of the deadliest substances on earth. The company later fessed up that they had buried drums of toxic chemicals, 21,800 tons of them in an abandoned canal over a 10-year period. They covered it with dirt. What could possibly go wrong? You may know this town as Love Canal. 
the company had buried it, hoping it would go away. Yet the poisoned leaked out, contaminating everything. It wouldn't go away, no matter how much they wanted it to. A deadly poison. And today's reading have a lot in common. Paul wrestled with questions we all have. This apostle struggled with issues familiar to us. He says, I don't understand why I act the way I do. He doesn't understand his own actions. When we look at others, sometimes we don't understand their actions. We've seen talk shows where people's lives are slowly being destroyed. Perhaps an alcoholic who knows drinking is killing him, but can't put down the bottle. Why does he do that? Maybe a gambler who wagered her house and lost it betting. She knows gambling is destroying her life, but can't back away from the casino. Why does she do that? Or a man who knows overeating is killing him, but can't stay away from the table. Why? Does he do that? Looking at people struggling with addictions, we want to say, don't you know that's bad for you? We'd like to believe if we could tell them loud and clear that their behavior was killing them, they'd stop. Yet they already know that. They don't lack information. Why do they persist in their destructive habits? They don't know. They're incapable of offering an explanation. Looking out upon the world, we wonder why people in general act as they do. Why were six million Jews exterminated by Nazi Germany? We don't know. Why do school children shoot teachers and fellow students in a murderous rage? We don't know. Why were 40,000 Muslim women raped by Serbian soldiers? We don't know. If this ignorance were simply limited to other individuals and other countries, we might rest assured it didn't touch our own lives. But we know better. For there are times when we don't understand our own actions. When younger, maybe we picked on a sibling we pushed them, making them cry. They told mom, who asked us, now why did you shove your sister? And all we could say was, I don't know. Or we wanted to be part of the in crowd in high school, so we didn't speak to a friend that they deemed weird. We don't know why we do the things we do. Or when older, we maybe had a little bit too much to drink, but our car was outside and we needed to get home. We knew that drinking and driving was stupid, but we went ahead and did it anyway. We don't know why we do the things we do. On an individual and societal level, we wonder why we and others act the way we do. This troubling question isn't new to humanity. 
Paul wrestled with this same dilemma. He struggled with this very issue himself. There are different answers to this question. The responses for human behavior vary. One place for answers is psychology. This science of the mind gives reasons for people's actions. To the questions we've posed, psychology replies, the alcoholic has a disease, and continued drinking is to correct an imbalance in brain chemicals. The gambler has an excessive need for thrill-seeking. The overeater sees food as their only friend and overeats for companionship. Psychology offers answers for individual behavior, for why larger groups act as they do. We turn to sociology, the science of human groupings. To why six million Jews were exterminated, sociology might say that Germany was suffering an identity crisis. The failure of democracy, high unemployment, and hyperinflation prepared the way for Nazism to provide a framework of meaning and purpose by demonizing Jews, Germans imagined themselves righteous. For school shootings in America, sociologists point to shooters' similarities, demonizing their school enemies so they become the righteous. The rape of 40,000 Muslim women in the Serbian war, simply an attempt to humiliate the enemy. Psychology and sociology try to explain individual and social behavior. They both see our world's symptoms, and each provides a diagnosis. Psychology says we live in a broken world, full of broken people, which is true. Sociology says that Social behavior and institutions are marked by com competition and conflict, which is also true. There's nothing wrong with either of these disciplines. Each have added greatly to understanding the human condition. Yet we know their answers are partial at best. Like that woman in Love Canal, we know there's more to the story than either provides. We take our global map and notice how many yellow dots there are. All the places where brokenness, hatred, violence, and degradation have happened. We see the yellow dots in our lives for all the times we knew the right, but did the wrong. Like that woman from Love Canal, there are too many dots on our map to be a statistical aberration. We know there's something more. Let's go to Paul with our questions. Using our imagination, let's see what he has to say. Paul will be our physician. We head to his clinic and unfold our map on the examining table. We say, this is a map of our life and the world around us. Each yellow dot represents a time when someone knew the right, but did the wrong. We've been to all our neighbors who suffer from the same malady. As you can see, the whole world 
is full of yellow dots. We've asked psychology and sociology, and we're here for a second opinion. Dr. Paul strokes his beard in deep thought and says, based on your symptoms, I diagnose your problem as sin. Sin, we say, shocked. That's not a word we hear much these days. Are you sure? Well, I am a specialist in this area, Paul replies. I wrote an article for the Journal of the Roman Medical Association a few months ago. Here it is. In reference to sin, in every part of me, I discover something fighting against my mind, and it makes me a prisoner of sin that controls everything I do. Even when I want to do right, I cannot. I have been sold as a slave to sin, not understanding why I do the things I do. I am not the one doing these evil things but rather the sin within me. What a miserable person I am. It seems Dr. Paul understands why so many dots are on the map. He has correctly diagnosed the symptoms of our lives and world, that of sin. Yet we have misgivings. Dr. Paul, sin has gotten a bad rap. It's associated with a lot of negative things. Fire and brimstone preaching. Scaring people into accepting Christ. And making people fearful of angering God. Sin is such a loaded word with associations of shame and guilt. This idea of sin has been a bully club to hurt many people. Dr. Paul nods his head compassionately and says, that's too bad. For despite its negative connotations, it's a useful idea Perhaps we should define sin for today's world as living in wrong relationship. Sin is living in wrong relationship with God, not loving God with our whole heart and mind. Sin is living in wrong relationship with neighbors, not loving them as ourselves. Sin is living in wrong relationship with ourselves, not living as the image of God. Sin is living in wrong relationship with God's creation, not caring for the world entrusted to us. A new definition of sin perhaps is needed. Living in wrong relationship. How else explain these yellow dots, he asked, pointing to our map? Imagine going to Dr. Paul for a diagnosis. Where does that leave us? What are we to do? As distasteful as the notion of sin is, it is a real presence in our world. How else explain the yellow dots on our maps? How else explain the cancer of the soul that affects us? How else explain the toxin that eats away from us from the inside when we know the right but do the wrong. We're all afraid to name sin in our midst, preferring to cover it up like that chemical company. We hope it'll just go away. But it seeps into our lives 
like a deadly poison. We want a nicer explanation, so we turn to psychology and sociology for answers. Both are helpful to a point, but matters of the spirit aren't their domain. Both disciplines speak volumes about the aberrations of the human mind and masses. They can point out the problems and offer some treatments, but in the long run, they fall short. The reason they fall short is because they only deal with the horizontal dimension of life. They restrict themselves in the interest of science to the observable world of human life. Both deal with life in this world on the horizontal level. Psychology and sociology offer partial answers to the presence of the yellow dots on the map. We Christians have something else to offer as an explanation. There is another component of life that we know about, matters of the spirit. Such a subject necessarily implies a vertical dimension to life. Sin is one such vertical dimension. We Christians need to take seriously the idea of sin. For too long, we in the mainline churches have been silent about it because others have misused it and abused others with it. We mainliners decided to bury it in the backyard, <laughs> covering it over with some dirt. Yet we do ourselves and the world a disservice if we do not speak about it. Rehabilitating sin as living in wrong relationship can make it speak to us today. We don't want to confess it, but it's true. We're sinners. If we don't talk about the sickness of sin, we can't talk about the healing of grace. If we're silent on sin, then grace becomes meaningless or cheap. We can't afford not to talk about sin to a world that wonders what's going on. We can't afford to be silent when so many see the problems but don't know where to turn for answers. When so many see the yellow dots on their maps and can't make sense of it, we need to be able to talk about sin so that the world might know grace as well. Folks around the world are crying out, we know the right, but do the wrong. What miserable people we are. Looking at the symptoms of our sick lives, we can diagnose it as sin. Looking at the symptoms of our sick world, we can diagnose it as sin. Wrong relationships throughout. Like Dr. Paul says, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is there is no cure for sin. There will never come a time in our lives when we can say that all traces of sin have left our body. Yet the good news is there is a treatment for the condition of sin, a treatment that takes into account both the horizontal and vertical dimensions of life, a treatment that takes into account both humanity and God, a treatment that takes into account both sin and grace, where is this treatment? It's in the cross, where both the horizontal and vertical meet. It's in the cross, where both humanity and God meet. It's in the cross, where both sin and grace meet. It's in the cross, where the yellow dots of our lives and world begin to make sense. It's in the cross, where we find a treatment for our sin-sick world. 
It's in the cross where humanity's sin and God's love is on display for all the world to see. Church, we know the answer to the question of sin. I ask you now to proclaim it with me. Who will rescue us from sin? Jesus will. Who will save us from ourselves? Who will deliver us from death? Who will give us new life? Who will give us grace? Who will show us mercy? Who will give us pardon? Who will show us forgiveness? Who will love us even when we don't deserve it? Thanks be to God for Jesus who will deliver us from sin and death and every bondage. It is in his glorious name of freedom that we lift our prayers and thanksgiving today. Amen. As we prepare to come to the table... I'd welcome all who are able to stand as we sing, These I Lay Down. Please stand as you're able. There are many things that we do not understand why we do them. But I think we can all agree that we know and understand why we come to this table. We come because through the grace of Jesus our Lord, we have been invited, all of us, equally. Let us pray. Bless this bread we break, that it may be to us the body of Christ, broken so that we may be whole. Bless this cup that it may be for us the cup of compassion poured out for all of us, every one. In unity with Christ and one another, may we be strengthened to carry out your ministry to all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Because Christ welcomed all, Without exclusion to his table, we extend his invitation to you today. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat the bread together.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us now drink the cup together. Having received the very presence of the risen Christ through these gifts, let us pray as he taught us, saying together, Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into Time of our offerings are also known uh, part of this worship. It is this spiritual practice, the spiritual practice of generosity, the spiritual practice of sharing what we have for God's work, the practice of loving one another as we love ourselves. We provide all of, God provides all of that we have, and we respond to God's love with a portion of what we have received. Today you are invited to lean into that best part of your identity, your generosity of heart. May we collect the generous gifts that we have. us pray. With gratitude, God, we offer you this gifts and symbol of the desire to live as Jesus has taught us to live. You are God from whom all blessings flow, and we praise you. And we thank you. With glad and generous hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a few announcements. One is that uh, volunteers are invited uh, to be part of our coffee fellowship, which is, uh, happens just about every Sunday. Uh, we just need folks to set out cookies and prepare coffee. And if you need questions or have, would like to be a part of that, you can see Audrey or Brenda as well. If you'd like to be part of the food pantry, as you heard about this morning in our prayer time, uh, see Rick or Martha. They'd be glad to get you connected to that ministry of help to the needy in our community and beyond. Today, you're, you're invited to the be part of the first session of the discussion of our General Assembly resolutions. Gather at 11.30 to eat and fellowship. I hope you packed a good lunch in your BYO bag. May want to trade with some folks around your table because that's kind of what happens sometimes. As well, at noon, we're going to shift discussion from that fellowship time from 11.30 to 12. At noon is when we're going to start our discussion on the first five resolutions plus the emergency resolution that was added later. And there are printed copies at the back if you didn't get one of those. Uh, we look forward to your questions and feedback. Resolutions for next Sunday's concluding discussion are also at the back. Uh, as well, we'd like your feedback on our fall small group options. A link was sent a few weeks ago, and we have heard from a few of you. But we'd like to hear from as many as can uh, to let us know whether the way of forgiveness or something on disciple identity might be your preference so that we can get books in advance and everyone is well prepped and ready for that mid-September start date. 
Next Sunday, I will be out, and Reverend David DeBow will be here uh, as our guest worship leader with his message in the footsteps of Paul and Silas. I'm grateful for him stepping in so that I can step out uh, and be present with my parents next week along with my brother. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on the 23rd. So I think that gives everybody... Oh, one more thing. Cookies. Speaking of cookies. uh, For next Saturday's service, celebrating the ministry of Reverends Doug and Kathy Myers worked. If you'd like to provide, help provide cookies for that reception, please see Judy. She'd be glad to get your assistance in that baking endeavor, uh, celebrating the ministry of our co-regional ministers who have served so long and so faithfully and so well uh, for this region and in the other places. I think that's all I got. And I'd ask you to stand at this point for our closing song. Hear the good news. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. His name is Jesus, a friend to sinners, whose grace abounds to make the wounded world whole. In his name we go. Amen.